Okay, welcome back to this week's lecture recording. I thought I'd start at the top and actually re-explore Brightspace just to make sure you guys realize where everything is. This is the course hall where you click on, uh, you log in and you click on political science class. Uh, you have your announcements here and each week I try to break down what you need to do step by step. So let's make sure we're organized. Uh, you can come over to content <clears throat> and uh, you can open things like the syllabus. Um, syllabus is here and you have everything if you open the syllabus you can go back to the calendar in the syllabus as it loads and if you hear a piano playing in the background that's my daughter taking a piano lesson recording this at home um, so you can access everything in your syllabus um, including course policies a lot of stuff you might have questions about everything's there my office hours that type of thing and then if you scroll all the way to the bottom you have this week's schedule so if you see this week's schedule okay uh, you see here we're in week five. Here's the dates. We're talking about civil rights. You have an initial discussion posted Wednesday. You definitely need to follow up to two classmates by Sunday and then also Sunday night. Each week you have a chapter five quiz. So we're, if we're looking at chapter five civil rights, let's go back to content <clears throat> and give it a moment to pull up. We can go over to reading and you actually have your reading here. And then this video will actually be posted on your lecture videos. I do those on a weekly basis. Here is everything from before so scroll back down to chapter five here's your reading here are your lecture notes that i used in live face-to-face -face lecture today which um keep in mind you're going to maximize your learning experience if you actually do the reading and there's actually pictures and stuff it's a little better than my notes but uh we have five major sections here i'm kind of going to roll them into four uh you know defining what civil rights are how do we identify them the african-american struggle for equality fight for women's rights civil rights indigenous groups native americans alaskans hawaiians and then also kind of some equal, other equal protection groups and some things that are going on in modern day so you have your reading here so you need to be make sure you're doing the reading okay some interesting reading there it's the thing about the citadel that's a local thing that happened um, and then you can scroll through your reading and you can learn a whole lot all right uh, let me go back to reading for a second let's get on with it with this uh, my lecture notes. Now what I do is each week I do a course prep where I write out lecture notes. This is normally what I would write on the board and we would cover in 150 minutes in a class, either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, but given the uh, precautions related to the pandemic, we're only meeting once a week, so for 50 minutes, um, this is my condensed lecture notes. I'm actually just giving them to you. So if you go to content, go under chapter five, this is what I would cover in class. And so I'm covering it for everyone here, whether you're virtual, in person, whatever it is. This is what we would talk about over you know, two or three lectures. So we're just going to cover it all today. So let's give an overview here. Uh, my notes are a little bit condensed, but it's some heavy duty stuff. So what are civil rights and how do we identify them? Civil rights are fundamentally guaranteed by the government that it will treat, that it and others will treat people equally, particularly people belonging to groups that have historically been denied the same rights and opportunities as others. Contrast this with what we talked about last week with civil liberties. Those are restraints on the government. So this is more of an empowerment, kind of a guarantee that the government's going to try to look for fair and equal treatment. Whereas civil liberties are like, yo, government, ease up, man. You're getting a little too to uh, grabby with my rights. Um, so how do we identify discrimination? Well, there are several different versions of the discrimination. There are age discrimination. You gotta be 18 to smoke or vote, 21 to, to drink, um, alcohol that is. Um, senior, senior citizens get a discount just for being old. I mean, that's discrimination. It actually is price discrimination. If I can go to a movie this afternoon at say four o'clock, and you have to see the same movie Friday night at 9 o'clock, you're going to pay more than I am. Let's say I'm just unemployed. I get rewarded for being unemployed. So if you think about it, like a citizen's, a senior citizen's discount or um, a matinee price versus a matinee price, um, <clears throat> a matinee price versus, say, a sorry Friday night price, uh, it's a big difference. Um, those are all forms of discrimination. However, with some forms of discrimination, we're okay with. Uh, so you can have age discrimination. Gender discrimination. Now, age and gender discrimination are both what we call intermediate, uh, subject to intermediate scrutiny by courts. They're not really hardcore looked at by courts, but they can be heard by courts. Uh, race and religious discrimination are both strict scrutiny uh, by courts. So they're, they usually come down pretty heavy handed from a federal level. Race discrimination is uh, discriminating against someone based on their race. Religious discrimination discriminating them based solely on their religious beliefs. Um, all forms of discrimination are subject to what's known as a rational basis test. Uh, this is where people, is there a reason for treating people differently? Is it legitimate? 
Is it in the government's interest to do this? For example, is technically biased to not allow blind people to drive. But blind people are not legally allowed to drive, and I think that's a, probably a good rule. So some forms of discrimination, like, hey, uh, you know, senior citizens get a discount. I'm okay with that. Blind people shouldn't drive. I'm okay with that. Um, so there are forms of discrimination that aren't always negatively bad, but there are definitely some bad forms of discrimination. It's happened repeatedly over time, which we're going to cover here in the next couple section, sections. Um, that have led to creation of things like affirmative action, which is somewhat sometimes controversial. Programs designed to benefit groups historically discriminated against. It's, it's basically a means to level the playing field. Uh, affirmative action has really been taken up in government agencies. Well, because they can. Private agencies, it's less you have less of ability to force it on people. Um, and then there are some key constitutional amendments here that we've talked about in previous weeks. 13th Amendment freed slaves. 14th Amendment gave civil liberties to slaves. 15th Amendment allowed black men to vote. So former slaves could vote. Um, notice I said men, not women. You have to go another six uh, decades before women have the right to vote. We'll talk about that in this section as well. So there are different issues in civil rights that emerge over time um, from, you know, the origins of our country, you know, slavery through the Civil War uh, and then the Civil War basically 100 years through the Civil Rights era and then to more modern day things like marriage equality, etc. So Let's shift gears specifically to the African-American struggle for equality. Um, it really kind of starts, I mean, it starts long before this, but in terms of uh, support, uh, Supreme Court uh, cases, Dred Scott versus Sanford, which is both a person and an area. Um, Dred Scott uh, was a slave uh, owned by someone who would travel to and from with his slave, Dred Scott, uh, to and from territories that technically sl slavery was not allowed. They were quote-unquote free states. So Dred Scott, living with his uh, master, um, as a slave in a free area, decided, you know what, I'm in a free area, why am I a slave? And he appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, and he was ultimately denied. So this is right before the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War ultimately settles the matter. Uh, after the Civil War, um, folks like Dred Scott, uh, with the uh, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, now this is everywhere, okay, uh, were freed. Um, they were given, again, as we talked before, 13th Amendment freed the slaves, 14th Amendment uh, gave civil liberties to slaves, and 15th minutes allowed, 15th allowed former slaves, at least men, to vote. Um, one, probably the most widely um, known and also misunderstood um, was uh, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, January 1, 1863, all persons shall be free. Uh, put an asterisk in there because it was limited to states that rebelled against the Union. So if you were in the North, you weren't freed as a slave. Uh, and so not freed in the Northern states. And then also, if you were in the South, but you were in an area that the Union had already, quote-unquote, liberated from the South, you were not freed either. So it didn't free in territories in the South that were held by Union troops. So all slaves in Charleston remained slaves. So it was kind of a kind of a strategy emancipation proclamation, um, at least in 1863, which then later led to the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, which did ultimately free and empower uh, slave people, even though they still faced years of disenfranchisement and discrimination. So Reconstruction throughout the South in 1865 to 1877, um, disenfranchisement was uh, widespread. That's attempts to prevent freed slaves from voting. The um, poll workers, uh, local municipalities, especially in the South, would would enact literacy and understanding tests. However, they would grandfather out white people uh, from these uh, tests, white male uh, landowners at the time, uh, which only people could vote. Um saying, oh, well, they're grandfathered out of these. Um, there were literally as many white people that couldn't read as there were freed slaves. So um, <laughs> kind of very selective attempts to apply these understanding tests, if you will. Uh, there was also financial disincentives given, like poll taxes. Basically, you have to pay you know, a certain amount of money to be able to vote, let's say. So if you want to vote this year, you got to pay me 20 bucks. Uh, that would turn a lot of people off from voting, uh, especially young people, saying college, you know, you know, to just give up 20 bucks to be able to vote. Um same thing was going on at that. Um, then uh, uh, the, the Jim Crow laws, essentially separate but equal, was born. We're talking late 1800s here, through all the way through the 1960s. Um, really, the push started in 1920s to return them, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So J Jim Crow laws, separate but equal, it was upheld by Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Uh, the NAACP in the 1920s, prior to the 1920s, had largely been a kind of leftist white-run organization um, perhaps that's why the name is, you know, the National Association for the Advancements of Colored 
people. Um, not exactly the most PC name in 2020. Um, so the NAACP in the 1990, uh, 1920s rather, um, actually became more black-led. So in the 1920s, they began to push to overturn Jim Crow laws and, uh, intentionally. Then 18 years passed by. I mean, think 18 years, man. That's like some of y'all's ages. Uh, 1938, Supreme Court gave states the choice of offering, offering separate schools, hospitals, uh, restaurants, etc. for African Americans. That pretty much uh, led us into the 60s and the 70s. Then in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, Supreme Court overturns uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and integration begins. So that's like a hot button thing from the late 50s all the way through the 60s, like I say, to like 19, early 1970s. Congress then proposes what becomes the 24th Amendment in 1962. So I mean, look at these time jumps 1920s, 1938, 1954, 1962, and it was ratified in 1964. So these are 20, 30, 40 years in the making, uh, the 24th Amendment. Uh, which led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed discrimination based on race, ethnicity, religion, sex, or uh, national origin by most employers. Um, this created the EEOC, which is the Equal Opportunity Commission, which monitored these types of things. Civil unrest continued, potentially, uh, potentially, particularly in the South. What do you think had things, organizations like uh, KKK, civil rights activists going back and forth. Now, in terms of civil rights activists, there were really two different main veins among uh, black civil rights activists. Um, there were leaders like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., MLK Jr., who emerged. Unfortunately, he was assassinated in 1968. Uh, and then there were more militant wings, like the uh, Black Panthers and Mal Malcolm X. Um, all of this, uh, advocates and everything, uh, we, we progressed through 1965 with the Equal Voting Rights Act, which uh, ended things like uh, poll taxes and intelligence tests and that type of thing. Uh, change was gradual and painfully slow at times, but it continues today. Uh, when you look at a lot of the social justice issues that we're dealing with today, we're still in a civil rights era. Continuing on, let's talk about the fight for women's rights. I know I happen to be teaching a class now. It's pretty much um, all male, not, not, mostly if not all. Um, but we need to recognize uh, the struggles that women went through in this country. Uh, in particular, if you talk about you, know, you were a slave that was freed in this 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, you still didn't have the right to vote. Um, that actually <laughs> took until 1920. So the women's rights movement, uh, it's known as women's suffrage, largely eclipsed by other movements, but uh, women's rights was, and is a long struggle. Um, voting rights were not attained until 1920, so we're just hitting the 100-year anniversary, just a little bit over that, um, here in 2020. So as you watch this maybe in future years, you realize it still wasn't that long ago. Pay, discrimi uh, bleh, pay discrimination towards women remains today. Uh, I have a, a wife who's a physician, and I observed this firsthand. Um, she had colleagues who had the exact same training, they just happened to be male, and they were offered somewhere up to like 30% more than she was. That's ridiculous. She is... <laughs> an outstanding physician and had the exact same qualifications, she was offered less because she was a female. I saw that. I saw that happen. That happens today. Um, things like glass ceiling, people thinking women can't be leaders, that type of thing, really sexist views. Um, uh, some of my most successful CEOs I've ever seen are actually female. Um, I look at the entrepreneurship club here. We call it Trep Club. 100% female-led at, at this moment, and we've never been more profitable. So that's that's just silly talk. Um Women are quite capable. Please keep that in mind. Um, late 1700s through the 1800s, something called coverture. Uh, that was a legal principle that stated when women married their, their legal, so when they got married to a guy, their legal identity was erased, essentially making them property of their husband. Think about that. That's a new form of laser, uh, uh, slavery. You're property of someone, you're a slave. Uh, in fact, if a married woman were fed, clothed, and sheltered, she could not legally leave her husband during this time. Think about that. That dude could be cheating on her, beating on her, doing all these types of things. As long as she was fed, clothed, and sheltered, there's nothing she can do about it. That's jacked up, dude. That's not a lot of civil rights. Uh, 1869, we started to see some organization, things like the National Women's Suffrage Association was formed, the American Women's Suffrage Association was formed. And then in 1890, so 21 years later, everything seems to happen in multiple decades here, they joined forces and formed what's known as the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And we started to, you know, this is 1890. 30 more years pass before they're able to get the 19th Amendment passed and all women are granted the right to vote. Dude. Man, decades. What in the world? All right. Uh, let's move on to the fourth and final section. Uh, we're talking about indigenous groups here, things like tribes, Native Americans, Alaskans, Hawaiians, and then also other things that are going on today. Um, so from the very beginning of the European settlement in North America, Native Americans were abused and exploited. Um, they were here first. They called shotgun, and we kicked them out of the car while the car was still moving. 
Uh, so they were subjected to attempted slavery. That didn't work out so well. Then they were denied citizenship. They're saying, ah, oh, well, you can't be citizens. You're, you are your own nation. Uh, the U U.S. government, quote-unquote, negotiated with Indian tribes. But as settlement expanded westward, uh, tribes removed time and again. Agreements were re repeatedly met, then violated, renegotiated, violated again, etc. In 1830, ah, man, shameful, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act that forced all Native Americans to move west of the Mississippi. Some were forcibly removed. So violence was there, like the U.S. Army was called in and made a move, like the Calvary. Uh, 1831, Supreme Court heard the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Uh, the Indian tribes were declared not to be sovereign nations. You can't force a sovereign nation to move, so if you better identify them as not a sovereign nation, so they were stripped of that status. But it was also decided Cherokee were entitled to ancestral lands and could not be forced to move from them. Now, in 1832, like a year later, War Worcester, uh, I, said War War I think it's Worcester, it's Worcester, uh, versus Georgia, said that whites could not enter tribal lands. Here's the thing, though. President at the time was Andrew Jackson, who was renowned for actually killing a bunch of uh, Native Americans in the southern states, in particular Florida, did not choose to enforce this finding. And between 1831 and 1838, many tribes were forced to move to the west. They were forced, yeah, asked, gunpoint by the U.S. Army, uh, where the Cherokee went from basically the Georgia area all the way out to Oklahoma, and that's known as the Trail of Tears. If someone by gunpoint made me walk from where I am right now to Oklahoma, I'd probably be a little bit upset too. 1887, Dahl's Severalty Act attempts to assimilate Indians into white society. Basically, you know what? If we can't get rid of these Indians, let's make them white. That didn't work either. 1924, Indian Citizenship Act. All Native Americans born after the act was enacted are now the U.S. citizens. Before that, I guess you don't get a say. Uh, 1934, Congress passes the Indian Reorganization Act that allows the tribes to self-govern even if they were restricted to reservations, quote-unquote. Conditions on reservations were bad, and this act did little to improve them. Same can be said for modern-day life on reservations where limited economic and educational opportunities. I had an opportunity this past summer to go to uh, Montana uh, to an Indian reservation on a mission trip with my church. Now, certainly, uh, witnessing was a part of that, but I was actually going to run a, help, help run a basketball camp. Um, these, these kids out there, uh, there's not a whole lot of economic opportunities, not a lot of educational opportunities. So one of the things that we try to do to, to show hope is, is bring hope through sports in Christ. Um, and due to the COVID pandemic, the basketball camp got canceled and I couldn't go. While the group was out there doing some construction uh, projects, that, that group still went. Um, they had about seven suicides that week. Uh, it's really bleak. Uh, economics are just limited out there, educational opportunities, and a lot of kids don't see a way out. A lot of people out there don't see a way out. And it's really, really sad, and a lot of it ties back to these things that we're talking about here. Uh, the Dolls Act, the Indian Citizens Act, uh, the Indian Reorganization Act, they're just... They were here first, man. They're treated like second-class citizens. Through the 1960s, a lot of Native Americans were inspired by the civil rights movement. Um, so their rights began to grow. They saw people like um, MLK um, standing up for rights of African Americans. Um, and they decided, you know what, that's, that's a pretty, pretty righteous move. We should do the same thing. So um, civil rights efforts to regain rights and lands for Native Americans continue even to this day. There are similar struggles with Alaskan tribes and Hawaiian tribes, um, areas that we, we um, have seen a lot of, say, uh, white Europeans move into. So um, same thing, uh, a lot of challenges with Hispanic and Latino groups have been sub subjected to similar struggles to those seen by uh, African Americans and Native Americans over time. Uh, man, Native Americans, when it comes to the discrimination, they were discriminated way before it was like in vogue. Um, they are the OGs, OGs of being discriminated. Immigration be, uh, remains a hot button topic today for many nationalities. I'd say immigration slash illegal immigration become a, a is still a hot topic. Um, Asian groups have faced discrimination as well. You had Chinese laborers uh, in westward expansion that were basically abused slave labor, building railroads westward. Uh, and then taking the kick, man. Japanese-American post um, Pearl Harbor were sent to internment camps during World War II because they said they couldn't be trusted. It was literally like concentration camps out west by Executive Order 9066. So um, you also have Americans with Disability Act, ADA passed in 1990, 1990 30 years ago. It's not that long ago. Um, I mean, can you imagine being, let's say, a black female uh, within a generation of being a freed slave who also was confined to a wheelchair. Whew. Okay, so within a generation of slaves who were freed in the 1860s, 
as a female, you didn't couldn't vote until the 1920s, and then if you would actually liked some protections for your disabilities, you had to wait till 1990. That's impossible unless you live to be 130, 140 years old. So that's incredible, um, the struggle that those folks have faced. Uh, so uh, some emerging civil rights issues today, you have the LGBTQ uh, plus community, um, you have marriage, questions of marriage equality, religious minorities, um, social justice issues that we're seeing today. In fact, uh, this book is actually pretty up to date, but a lot of the stuff that's happened with social justice has been more or less in 2020. So um, at least coming to the forefront, it's been going on for quite a while, but in terms of the forefront, I'm sure the next version of this textbook is going to have a lot more about that. So keep in mind that the civil rights era, everybody's like, hey, it's not in the civil rights era. Yeah, it is. Uh, we're still there. So that's just kind of an overview of my notes that I would normally have done over several classes, uh, 275 minutes or 350 minutes in a normal semester, and you, we would have had a lot more time to discuss it. We would have watched MLK's I Have a Dream uh, uh, video. You can find it on YouTube. Definitely do that. Um, you can learn a lot. That's, that, that was an insightful speech. And uh, make sure you're doing the reading. Uh, do the discussion. You need the initial post by Wednesday night. Um, and then you need to uh, have two follow-ups by Sunday and also the quiz. If you're trying to do the quiz just off these notes, you're not you know, 70 maybe you might. But if you do the reading, you get a hundo right out, the, right out the gate. So hope you guys are doing well. That wraps up this week's uh, Civil Rights Lecture Notes uh, video overview.